They were in the huddle. And he was the quarterback. And after he called the play with no visible play clock, he took a moment to talk. He looked each of his teammates in their eyes. And he said, men, before we go out there, we have a choice. We can choose to give it our all. We can choose to take no prisoners. We can choose today to become champions. But the choice is yours. Will you block on every play? Will you run as fast as you possibly can? This is why we practice. This is why we prepare. Today is the day. Today is the day of destiny. Today is the day that will define us men. Are you with me? And to a man, every single one of them said yes. Then he went out there, and he put up numbers Aaron Rodgers would be jealous of. Each time that ball left his hand, you could just hear it whistle through the air. It seemed like every throw was a perfect spiral. And when the day had ended, it was not one, two, three, or even four, five, or even six, but it was seven touchdowns on the stat book to one lone interception. Nobody could doubt. Nobody could argue that Baxter Colburn had had (laughs) the flag football game of the week. And, And in case you didn't know about it, Last Tuesday, you saw this on social media. Now, let me pull back the curtain just a little bit for you. The PFL stands for the Peninsula Football League, which is the football league that Baxter himself started. (laughs) This would be the equivalent to me on Tuesday posting Lakeside Employee of the Week with my picture on it, all right? That's what this is right here. Today we're talking about success. Now, not all of us have started our own flag football league and stacked the team so that we have the best team and we put ourselves as quarterbacks so we all throw for seven touchdowns every week and then name ourselves the offensive player of the week and post it on social media. Not all of us, not all of us have done that in our lives. Now, maybe you've done something equivalent. And if you have, then success comes a little easier to you than for most of us. Most of us, it's a little more difficult than that. But today, we're talking all about success. Thanks so much for joining us here at Lakeside. We're in the middle of something we're calling life. And what this is, is it's just a look at every aspect and every facet of life. And so we started by seeing that if we follow Jesus, we have nothing to fear. That we can walk through the biggest points of fear and anxiety in our lives, but if we follow Jesus, there is nothing in this life that we have to fear. We don't even have to fear death as a result of following Jesus. Then we saw that God is the author and creator of life, and so every life matters. Every single person matters. Then we started looking at priorities and what we, what we put our focus on and, and what we really go after. And last week, we looked at suffering. And what happens when things don't go according to plan? And where is God in the midst of that, and how should we respond? And so today, we're going to talk about success, how to respond when things go well, and what to do when things are working accordingly. So if you have your Bible apps on your phones or your tablets, you can follow along. If not, the verses will be on the screens as we dive in this morning to the book of 1 Timothy. And we're going to start in 1 Timothy 6, beginning in verse 1 where we read these words that the Apostle Paul, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, wrote to Timothy. And he says this, Let all who are under a yoke as bondservants regard their own masters as worthy of all honor, so that the name of God in the teaching may not be reviled. Let me read that again. Let all who are under a yoke as bondservants regard their own masters as worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and the teaching may not be reviled. Now understand, this was written in a society where there was still slavery in play. 
where there was still slavery in play. And it's not condoning that, but what the Apostle Paul is telling to Timothy to instruct the people to do is to regard their masters as worthy of all honor. So the implication for us today in a society, thankfully, that no longer has slavery is, is this, that we need to see our bosses as, as people who are worthy of honor. And what that says, if we see our bosses as people who are worthy of honor, it says that we will represent God well. This is a way that we can represent God well, to see our bosses as people who are worthy of honor. Now, I understand there are times where you're going to think your boss is the biggest idiot you've ever encountered, ever. And you're going to be like, they're just stupid. All right? You're, you're going to feel that way sometimes, unless you're the boss. And then you're going to be like, man, these people have the best boss ever, right? Because everybody thinks, everybody thinks as soon as they get in charge that everything's going to go great and they're never going to make a mistake. Just listen to every political speech, right? Everybody thinks as soon as they're in charge, everything's going to work perfectly and all the ideas are going to be great until they get there. And it never works out that way. If you have a boss, they have made some horrible calls. If you are the boss, you have made some horrible calls. It's just the way it is. If you're not the boss, you've made some horrible calls. So just understand this, that your boss, according to Scripture, is worthy of honor. And this says something about how we represent God. Now, am I saying that you need to stay into a toxic, abusive work situation? No, no. And there are situations where you need to get out because it is. It's toxic, it's, 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 just, it's degrading, and it's not a good environment for you to stay in. But rather than be in that environment and you sabotage it and you have a bad attitude and you have a boss that you can't honor, you need to proactively find a place where you can go work in a place that's not toxic and in a place where you can honor your boss. But in the meantime, you need to give that boss honor. Don't stay in a situation that is dangerous or abusive, certainly. I'm not advocating that. But what I am saying is don't tear down the boss because this speaks directly to how you represent God. That's what 1 Timothy 6.1 tells us. And then he continues. Those who have believing masters must not be disrespectful on the ground that they are brothers. Rather, they must serve all the better since those who benefit by their good service are believers and beloved. Those who have believing masters must not be disrespectful on the ground that they are brothers. Rather, they must serve all the better since those who benefit by their good service are believers and beloved. So this means if your boss is a Christian... You really have to do a good job. You really have to do a good job. As an employee, be somebody who shows honor and respect. As an employee, as a follower of Jesus, this is the starting point. Show your boss honor and respect. Not only will this help you advance the cause of Jesus, not only is this a great example that you're living out the faith that you proclaim in God, but check this out. Over 50% of businesses right now report they are currently unable to find quality employees to fill their job openings. Over 50% of businesses right now report that, report that they are unable to find quality employees to fill job openings that they currently have. And if you will make it a point to show honor and respect, you are putting yourself so far ahead of the competition in a job market that's already desperate for laborers and workers. You are setting yourself up for success on something that you can control. It doesn't take education. It doesn't take anything else. It's a mindset, and you have the power to determine it. And it's biblical that you would just say, I am going to be someone who treats my boss with honor and respect. These are two things that you can control that are biblical, and they will put you on the path to be successful. The passage continues. Teach and urge these things. If anyone teaches a doctrine a different doctrine, 
and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. Your conduct reveals what you really believe. How you conduct your life reveals what you really believe. If you want the test, if you're ever wrestling, if you're ever struggling, what, what do I really believe? What is, what is really foundational to me? Check your conduct. That reveals what you truly believe. And so if you choose to argue with Scripture and what the tenets the Scripture presents, if you choose to, to debate it and, and to just argue with it, not that you're wrestling through trying to come to terms with it or understanding it, because again, God is greater than us. And so there are going to be aspects of God's Word that we read and we're like, hmm, I don't, I don't know that I really love that. Or I would do it differently. Well, I really hope we could all look at God and say, you know, uh, God, I would want you to do some things very differently. Because if we don't look at God that way, then we brought God down to our level. And that's really scary, okay? So there are some things that we just need to say, I can't fathom, I don't understand. There may be some things that we really struggle, because at our core, we're like, I really don't like that, and I really don't want to agree with it. But the question is, who's God? And if God is supreme, and he is, and if God's in control, and he is, then we need to bend our will to God's will and not try to bend God's will to our will. So here's the deal. If you choose to argue with scripture and try to keep bending it, not that you don't understand it, but you understand it, and you just keep trying to bend it to, to be in your prism and in your sphere rather than submit yourself to what scripture says because God is God and you are not, then scripture tells us this, you are conceited and misguided. You're conceited and misguided. And that might offend you. Okay? Okay sorry. Like, that's what scripture says. Don't hate the messenger. <laughs> scripture says this, not me. This is what scripture says. It continues. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy. Talk radio. I added that. And for quarrels about words, which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. As people who follow Jesus, be wary of people who always want to fight. Be wary of people who always want to fight. And the danger is when you find somebody who's a firecracker and they got some fight in them, and they're on your side, it feels good. You're like, yeah. You're like pointing them in direction, right? You're like, hey, throw a little gas. You, you, you know, you throw a little gasoline over here. You hand them the light, and you're like, hey, have you, have you seen what's going on over there? You're like, go right on over. And then you just watch the explosion. And I mean, it's like 4th of July. Who doesn't love fireworks? You kick up your feet, and you're like, ha, this is, this is fun. Here's the problem. Those people who love to fight, those little firecrackers, those little pit bulls that are in your corner... <laughs> They love to fight. And sooner or later, they're going to run out of people to fight with. And the only person standing there is you. Be careful. Be careful. Because it's in their DNA. It's who they are. They just love to fight. And when everything else is exhausted and there aren't any more targets around, you're next. And what you love to watch from afar now comes on you. My sister-in-law was out jogging one day, just minding her own business. And out of the corner of, the, of, of her eye, she saw a blur. And she was attacked by a pit bull. She had to go to the hospital. She had to be treated for injuries. By the grace of God, she's She's okay. But she carries some small scars on her from the point of attack. And the people who own the dog said, well, the, the pit bull, it, it never it attacked anyone before. And I don't care if you own pit bulls, whatever, I, I don't want to own them. But the, the reality is when you look at dog attacks, it's in their DNA. 
That pit bull, unprovoked, ran out and attacked my sister-in-law and had to be put down. If you surround yourself with people who love a good fight, you are setting yourself up for disaster. If you are a person who loves a good fight, ask yourself why. I know it feels good when they're in your corner, and I know it feels good to have an advocate, but beware. It's in their DNA. And sooner or later, it's just what they do. They attack. They fight. And you're going to be next at some point. Be careful. He talks about godliness, imagining that godliness is a means of gain, that people will try to profit off God. Now, here's the deal. I can't see anyone's heart, and I thank God for that. I really do. I, th- I can't see anybody's heart. I don't know their motives. I can look at the outward expressions of their life, as, as Scripture tells us to do, but I can't see anybody's heart. But, but that said, Let's just all be a little bit cautious about this Kanye revival, all right? Let's just all be a little cautious about this. For those of you who are following along, some of you are like, who's Kanye? See me again in about three minutes. Okay, but for those of you, those of you who know who Kanye is, you know right now he's traveling around doing the Sunday service thing, and you've got all kinds of people who are really excited about this. But this, this, again, I don't know Kanye's heart, and I hope it's genuine. I really do. I hope Jesus takes hold of Kanye's life, because that cat is talented. And I would love for us to be jamming to some Kanye songs up here in a year or two, right? I would, and some of you, again, who are like, who, Kanye? You're like, no, that'd be awful, Brian. That's the worst idea you've ever had. Thank you very much. Remember when you started this, you said some bosses have really bad ideas? Well, we'll chalk this up to one of your bad ideas. But for those of you who know who Kanye is right now, he's going through the Sunday service thing. And let's just, let's just all be cautious because for some reason what happens in the Christian world especially is we just love celebrity for some reason. I don't know why, but we just love celebrity. We really do. We love celebrity. And so at the first sign that an artist or um, An actor, a musician, an old professional athlete, professional wrestlers for a while. I mean, that was all the rage, whatever the case may be. But we just love the first mention that they throw out of God. We just love to cling on to. And then they write a book, and and everybody goes out, and they buy the book, and they put them on the speaking circuit. And then a year or two from them, it just it kind of falls. I mean, it's, it's a cycle, and we've seen it repeated over and over and over again. Let's make sure we don't worship celebrity, and let's make sure that that we just say, hey, let's get to the content of the message. That's what really matters and not the messenger, okay? Because there are people, and I'm not accusing Kanye of this. I'm just saying let's all be cautious about this with the latest Kanye revival. There are people who have discovered that proclaiming the name of Jesus can be lucrative especially when you couple it within our culture, Christians love of celebrity. And Scripture says, be wary of that. Be wary of that. And so let's make sure at Lakeside, we always keep what really matters at the forefront. And that is the message of the hope and the love and the restoration and the work that Jesus Christ offers. And we never elevate the role of the messenger to be anywhere near the importance of the message. So don't be awed by celebrity. And then he says this, to contrast all that, but godliness with contentment is great gain. But godliness with contentment is great gain. I want to tell you something. Success is a choice. This is its secret. Success is a choice, and this is its secret. That godliness with contentment is great gain. First, pursue God. Pursue God. 
If you want to be successful, pursue God. Second, be content. Now, when I say successful, I understand that, that raises alarms in some people's mind. But understand this. Success that we're talking about, biblical success, looks a lot different than the picture of success that many of us have in our minds when we first hear that word, success. And so biblical success is this, that our lives look like God. That God becomes greater and we become less. That when people look at us, they see more and more of Jesus and less and less of us. Godliness with contentment is great gain. So we first pursue God and second, we become content with what we have. And why this is important is revealed to us. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. And so I just want to ask you the question that we talked about a couple weeks ago, but I want to circle back to it. What are you pursuing? What are you pursuing? And why are you pursuing it? What are you pursuing and why are you pursuing it? And just remember, we're all ending up in the ground. Whether it's in a box or a bunch of ashes, we're all ending up in the ground. And we can't take any of this stuff with us. So what are you pursuing and why are you pursuing it? Again, I want to be crystal clear. Wealth is not wrong. But the question is, what are you pursuing? And why are you pursuing it? It says this. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. Did you get that? Like parents of teenagers right now, you need to highlight this verse, save this verse, text your kids this verse every day, right? But if we have food and clothing, you give a teenager food and clothing and tell them to be content. <laughs> Good luck. Right? Like food and clothing, with these we will be content. Some of us, we might need to scale back a little bit and really ask ourselves the question of what makes us content? Is it food? Is it clothing? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to garner to, to guess for most of us, the list goes a little bit beyond the food and the clothing will be content. I know it does for me. Like, Oh, Brooklyn right now is praying, God, please let Brian really live this verse out. Please let him latch on to this. Food and clothing. I miss this so often. I do. I don't think I'm like, and, and this, is, this is where it gets so tricky, right? Because I, I can easily go to the card of, I have an iPhone SE. Do you know how pathetic this phone is right now? Like, there is zero dollar trade-in value on this. Criminals in Russia don't even want to buy this phone off eBay anymore, all right? That's how pathetic the phone I have is. So I'm like, yeah, I'm good. I don't struggle with this. And then I look at some other aspects of my life, and I'm like, okay. Okay. I'll empty the Amazon cart. <laughs> this is the secret. Let's just go back to understand what really matters and what's really important. And let's all strive in a, in a culture and a society that this concept is so foreign in. But let's all strive to get to the point where we say, if my needs are met, I'm good. 
if my needs are met, I'm good. That if we have food and if we have clothing, we'll be content. That success looks like us, first and foremost, striving after God. And second, that we'd realize our needs are met. That we have clothes to wear. That we have food to eat. That we are alive. And if we can adopt this and if we can really follow through with this mindset, it frees us up from so many things that enslave us and hold us back. Forget about the who's who's list, all right? Forget about the richest people list. Let's get back to this because this is what success is. That we try to become more like Jesus and we are grateful that our needs are met. This is the secret to success. And here's why. Verse 9 tells us, But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. I listened to the Thing About Pam podcast this week. It was, it was atop the iTunes charts. And for those of you who had no idea who Kanye was, okay, welcome back. I'm going to tell you this. The Thing About Pam was a Dateline NBC podcast, all right? See? You guys, if you don't know Kanye, I know you know Dateline. So Keith Morrison from Dateline, who has one of the greatest voices ever, did a podcast all about this murder mystery that was just, it was, it was a whole web, and basically, of course, the husband was thrown in jail, because, guys, it's always the husband, right? That's, that's what anybody that works in crime will tell you. It's always the husband. But here they found out what actually had happened, well, what they think actually had happened. I don't want to get sued, allegedly. This is all according to the thing about Pam podcast. Don't sue me personally. I cast no aspersions. I don't have any details. My takeaway from the podcast, sue them, not me for slander or libel or whatever it may be. <clears throat> My takeaway was that the person who actually murdered the woman was a lady named Pam, who was actually the life insurance beneficiary of this woman and who concocted a scheme with another individual and murdered him in the process. She then took the life insurance money and didn't give it to the kids as she told the woman who was murdered she would if something happened to her. She spent it on herself. Now, am I saying if you pursue money that you're going to murder someone? No, I'm not. But I promise you this, if money is your aim, if you desire to just be rich, you will start down a path that will take you places that you never intended to go. And you will make compromises that you otherwise would not make if money is your sole focus and if money is your aim. If your sole desire is to be wealthy, you will wreck your life. If your sole desire is to be wealthy, you will wreck your life. And you don't have to take my word for it. Just watch a marathon on a cable channel during the day. Story after story of actor, musician, athlete, who seemingly had it all. And whose life fell apart. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. I want to be crystal clear here. It is the love of money, not money itself, but the love of money that is the root of all evil. When money becomes our aim, we are welcoming disaster. When money becomes our focus, we will wreck our lives. And by the way, discontentment is where the love of money loves to grow. Discontentment is the soil where the love of money roots itself. And it takes us on a path that will 
wreck our lives. So how do we know when money becomes a love? Well, I'm going to give you some, some ways that you can tell. First is this. Money becomes a love when it causes you to disengage from Jesus and his church. When money becomes the sole focus and it causes you to disengage from your relationship with Jesus and disengage from the community that Jesus set up, the church, it's become a love. Money has become a love when it becomes your sole focus and motivator. When all you care about is more, 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 and that is your focus and your motivator, it's become a love. Money becomes a love when you view giving back to God as an obligation rather than a blessing. When you view having to, having to give back to God as a have to, right? Rather than a I can. When giving, when giving back to God doesn't bring joy and it isn't one of the first things that you love to do after you've been paid, but rather it's an obligation and it's something of, oh, well, I got to do this according to scripture. Or you don't give it all. I'm telling you, money has become a love when you don't freely give your resources back to God, viewing it as a blessing and rather see it as an obligation or just something you don't do. Money has become a love when it's more important than people. When money becomes more important than people, it has become a love. And money has become a love when it's the measure by which you evaluate your work and the worth of others. When you evaluate your worth and the worth of others based on finances, money has become a love. Now, I get it. Some of you are thinking, oh, yeah, okay. We're in church. This is, yep, yeah, pastor loves to talk about money, right? Here's the deal. Don't take my word for it. Take scripture's word for it, but even if you're a little skeptical about that, it was reportedly on his deathbed where his final words were these, and it doesn't surprise me because there are many documented times that he said these words before he died. But Bob Marley said, money can't buy life. Money can't buy life. And the question I have for you is what is the relationship that money has in your life? Because for so many of us, we see success as the opportunity to acquire more. And that's the scorecard. How big our 401k is, or our savings account. How great the vacation we can take is. And there's nothing wrong with any of those things. I encourage you all to save. I encourage you all to spend less than you make. I encourage you all to take a vacation. Unplug and de-stress. But when that becomes our focus, when that becomes our motivation, when that becomes how we see our own value, in the value of others, when that stops us from freely giving back to God and instead viewing it as an obligation rather than an opportunity and something that we excitedly do to partner with Him in the work that He doesn't need us for anyways, but graciously chooses to use us. When it causes us to disengage from Jesus and the church, it's become a love and discontentment somewhere in your life is the soil in which you allowed that to happen. And the secret to success is that our lives would look more and more like Jesus and we would be content. Money can't buy life. So what's your aim? And what's your focus? And what's your motivation? My hope is that we would all learn to adopt this, this radical viewpoint in our culture 
of what success really is. And that's godliness with contentment. And our lives will be blessed as a result. God, I pray that we would see success as you define it. That godliness with contentment would be what describes us. God, that we would never look at our worth and think it's derived by our net worth. God, that we would never see money as more important than people. That we would never view giving back to you as an obligation or something we begrudgingly do. But instead, God, that we would be so excited to partner in the work that you're doing. God, that money wouldn't rule our lives, but you would. And so I pray, God, that you would help us redefine success in a culture that doesn't see it. That we would follow after you. And that, God, we would be satisfied with enough. Thank you for meeting our needs. Thank you for loving us. And God, help us see success in the way you do. In your son, Jesus' name we pray.